G'day fellas and welcome to an emergency tier list video. That's right, I've stolen that off Beastie. Beastie, I'm sorry. It is because FFA is due to drop soon. We're going to do things a little bit differently today. What we're going to be doing is watching an FFA and at the same time talking about FFA. There's going to be a lot less focus on this game, but of course we're still going to watch it. We're going to see what happens. And if we don't get, or if we get through the, the tier list and at the end we've still got some time, we might share this game together and watch exactly what happens. So... Without further ado, let's get to it. Today's tier list is going to be about free-for-all. It's going to be about free-for-all civilizations. Now, the game that we're watching today is not actually free-for-all. This is a 2v2v2v2, which means that your free-for-all is only a little bit free. Uh, you you got you to share victory with some other person. So let's get into it. Our tier list for today, we're going to start off with the most popular civilizations and make our way down to the least popular civilizations. And starting off, it's going to be the English, which is in the A tier. Now, when it comes to putting civilizations in specific tiers, I want to let you know that this is about the entirety of the game and making sure that you're aware that this is not just, you know, what's the best late game civilization or what's the best early game. It's that whole culmination of every single aspect of that nice micro right here from Crackity here. Uh, what is, uh, it, it's that culmination of everything together. So the reason why the English go into the A tier, not the S tier, not the B tier, they're, they're a pretty good civilization. And that is because they're strong in the early game and incredibly strong in the late game. Most importantly, in the early game, you, you're going to have access to the council hall. And that means that sometimes when you're playing, so as an example here, if we take a look and see, Crackity has spawned very close to his ally here. But in the event that this wasn't his ally, if this was his opponent and he was playing the English, he'd be very easily able to put on pressure early on because of that council hall. And that gives him quite a bit of insurance because it's not just about FFA sitting in the corner, like we've got Muzz doing over here, just having a good time. It's not just about that. It's also going to be about making sure that if someone spawns close to you, you're going to be able to deal with them quickly and efficiently. And that's one of the keys to FFA. You don't want to get locked in this long, drawn-out battle. You want to make sure that if you take someone out, you take them out quickly, decisively. That's really, really important. Now, I just want to note something here. Look at this. We've got uh, Fugslang. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And his uh, ally, Mars, over on the other side of the map. These guys are going to have a tough time this game, that is for sure. Uh, because they are so far away from each other. So, with, the, with regard to the English, though, just talking more about the FFA tier list, uh, it's important to note that the English are incredibly strong in the late game. One of the big components uh, to the English late game is going to be their enclosure technology. This is going to guarantee that throughout the game, they've got infinite sources of gold. And this is going to help them out a huge amount because it means uh, upgrades, once you've picked them all up, uh, you can rely on utilizing that gold for units. And it's going to be mana arms that are just going to be so powerful. And obviously that synergizes well with the English because their mana arms are already incredibly good. So if there's any civilization that is going to be really good for just sitting in a corner and hopefully going unnoticed, it's going to be the English. And remember that even in the event that you find people close to you, you're still going to be able to deal appropriately with them because of that. The main weakness that you've got though as the English and the main reason why they're not S tier is because they are rather susceptible to that mid-game timing push during the castle age or at least when other players are starting to get their lances or knights online that's when they become susceptible because they typically go into a big longbow mass and then that leaves them exposed to that lancer knight combination of cavalry so anyway that's the english let's get on to our next most played civilization it's going to be the ottomans and this civilization is also going in the a tier a civilization which, in my opinion, was very close to being in the S tier, but o o only uh, just put it through to the A tier. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of tempted. I'm just, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. It's going in the S tier. I've talked myself into it. And the reason why is because the Ottomans is obviously a powerhouse throughout the game, right? There's no real weak point for this civilization. And I think that's the reason in my head why, why I just moved it from the A to the S tier. I'm like, this guy, this guy doesn't have a weak point. Uh, he is good all game long. And most importantly, when it gets to Imperial Age, it is an absolute behemoth. We've seen games before where there are so many bombards out on the map, it is very difficult to deal with. We've seen players deal with it. Obviously, the most recent FFA that we casted, there was like, what, 20 bombards that Core had, but he's still, uh, Don Artie was able to take them out, uh, and yet... I still call them very good. And that is because, well, not every player is as skilled as Don Artie. Don Artie is rated like 2.2k ELO. It, it took a very uh, coordinated effort there. Uh, you know, and a, and a man of, of Don Artie's strength, caliber, and speed. Uh, I want to emphasize speed because Don Artie's a very quick player. Uh, but uh, he was able to take it out. But not every player is going to be able to. And th there's just such a beautiful combination that the Ottomans have got in the late game. And that being great bombards, Janissaries, and Sapahi. 
it is such a difficult combination to deal with. It is so damn good. Uh, and I suspect that the Ottomans are going to be a really strong force in FFA uh, moving forward. The other thing to note is that the Ottomans are, are quite strong in the early game. If they, they want to play heads up, if they want to play feudal, they will be quite strong there. They have access to the Twin Minaret Madressa, which means that in FFAs, if you don't spawn close to a food source, so here as an example, we see the Chinese in the north has spawned close to a food source. Chinese in the west has spawned close to a food source. Most people have spawned close to that deer hunt, but uh, not everyone, every game will get access to it. And that Twin Minaret Madressa is going to give you a little bit of insurance, uh, a little bit of food security, and that's really important in the early game. So I think that the Ottomans are going to be a great civilization for FFA. Let's get into the next most popular civilization. It's going to be the Japanese. I'm going to put the Japanese in the B tier. I think that the Japanese are a solid late game civilization, but they do lack a little bit of uh, strength in the early game. Obviously, once they reach Castle Age, they're going to excel because they're going to be able to pick up relics and they're really going to start uh, taking control of the area around them. But that's going to be on the condition that they have access to gold. That's going to be on the condition that they don't have uh, too many people surrounding them and also on the condition that they can find relics and that they aren't denied them. So there's a lot of conditions there for the Japanese. In the event that they do make it to the late game, they've got a really strong unit, that being the Samurai. The Samurai is great because with the way that free-for-all is going to work in Season 7, what you're going to have are you're going to have a... In, in, insanely big armies. I was trying to get the word out. I just couldn't because I, you know, I, I'm so excited. Uh, but um, you, you've got insanely big armies and that is a good thing for the Japanese. What that means is that by having the bigger armies that you've got access to more Samurais. And the more Samurais that are on the field, naturally the better it is because you they're, they're a unit that you just set and forget. You don't have to think about them. Uh, you don't have to look at them. You don't have to micro them. You just get those Samurai, the Bagasha, uh, you know, the, the Mounted Samurai as well, and you just let it go. And that's something difficult to deal with on the defense defender's perspective. Uh, the only problem is with regard to their economy. While the Japanese economy looks super duper strong, right, on paper, in the late game, one of the things that I've found is that the Japanese economy begins to fall off. If, you're wearing, if we're comparing Castle Age to Castle Age, the Japanese look amazing because they've got access to that wonderful uh, Daimyo technology where they can get up to a 75% bonus. The problem is as you go later on into the game and you start talking about 70% uh, 80, 90 farms, the Japanese start to fall off because it means that you've got to start upgrading all of your town centers. And it's a big investment. We're talking about 300, 600, 1200 gold that needs to be invested. So a total of 21, or sorry, stone, uh, 2100 stone that needs to be invested to pump up those uh, town centers. And the reality is there's just not that much stone on the map. So you, you run into this problem where you've got this, you know, booming economy, but unfortunately not enough town centers to give them all that influence. So that's one of the ways I think about it. Uh, I, I think the Japanese will be quite strong at lower levels just because of how potent the samurai is uh, but I think at the higher levels the Japanese will be a civilization that's probably uh, not going to be doing the best. Now I, I guess this is probably a reasonable point at the 8 minute mark uh, to, rem or to remind you that this is a subjective tier list, okay? This is my opinion, and obviously, oh god, obviously uh, your opinion may be different, and that's absolutely okay. We're allowed to have different opinions, uh, but if your opinion does differ, or you think that I've vastly under or overestimated something, let me know down in the comments, and uh, we can always come back and revisit a month after FFA, because remember, this is going to be an FFA tier list that's an emergency tier list. Uh, that means that uh, we don't have a whole bunch of, uh, of ins oh gosh, look at all these sheep. We don't have a whole bunch of insight yet exactly how it's going to go. You know, there might be an overpowered civilization that we just just never knew it was sitting there the whole time. You know, like the, the Delhi Sultan. How are they so good? Well, the trick is you got to find one sacred site and then you stonewall it 55 times. That's how you win with Delhi. Okay, there you go. Cool strat. Uh, but uh, yeah. Anyway, let's move on to our next civilization. So it's going to be the Byzantines, another civilization that I think is going to be very strong in free-for-alls. This civilization, the Byzantines, is notorious in 1v1 once you get towards that mid to late game. And it's going to be the same thing that happens here. The synergy is really powerful for the Byzantines in the late game uh, just because of their olive groves together with their Lamentini. Now the Lamentini is going to be nerfed in this patch um, and we can see right there that uh, we've got a little bit of an attack going on here. Um, so yeah, with the Byzantines, they, their Lament Knight is getting nerfed. Uh, but their late game, I, I think, will still be very strong. And this is going to be empowered by the fact that when we're playing in free-for-all, that we are going to have access to a lot more population space. And I think that's only going to be something that helps the Byzantines in the same way that it helps the Japanese with Samurai. Uh, and it'll just be with Lament Knight, right? Like, it'll just be an insane economy that is pumping non-stop. Uh, and as a result, you're just going to see Lament Knight flooding the field. But the Byzantines have got access to a very strong early game. If there's anybody that's... I, I say very strong. I, 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 I should 
shouldn't say very strong, but they've got access to a strong early game, uh, solid mid game, and a very powerful late game. Uh, and because of that, I suspect that they're going to do very well in free-for-all. Remember, when it comes to free-for-all, you don't have to random. You can pick your civilization. So picking... What is going on right here? All these guys are just chilling out. Uh, so picking the Byzantines, well, I, I, I endorse it. I think this civil, or the Byzantines is going to do very well. In fact, we do have a Byzantine player in this game. So maybe we'll track him for a little bit. We've got Shuckle. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who Shuckle is. I don't know what ranking he is. The uh, only people I know in this game are... I know Crackity here, and I know 10-4 Tim. I've seen him streaming over on Twitch plenty, and obviously Crackity, we've casted plenty of his games. Uh, so they're the only two I know. So we'll, we'll probably be watching those guys as Crackity's the first to cross 1,000 score. Uh, so, yeah, overall, I, I think that the Byzantines are definitely going to be a civilization to watch. And when it comes to the threat meter, it's a civilization that you probably want to try and take out uh, rather than letting them get to the late game. The main threat isn't going to be from things like cataphracts. I don't think people are going to really be making cataphracts. They're not that scary of a unit. I mean, sure, they look scary if it's like 100 cataphracts versus 100 royal knights, but... You're not making 100 cataphracts, man. That's a lot of resources. It really is. All right, well, let's get on to the next civilization. It's going to be the Mongols. This is a civilization that, in my opinion, has gone through some ups and downs. But one of the things that we have started to see is the prominence of walls. Players are walling more. And that's because of the change that happened recently where walls allowed you to start connecting resources. Uh, so naturally, we've seen walls become more important uh, but most importantly for the mongols is they lack walls in the late game so what it means is that if you're playing the mongols and you're, you're over in this position you've got a great little spot over here unfortunately if your opponent tries to raid you you have to be able to counter that raid with units or with a huge amount of outposts otherwise you're not going to be able to really deal with it i've just realized that my health bars are off completely uh, i was i was doing a couple of screenshots you may have may have noticed them on on the thumbnails for the ffa videos uh, hence why we don't have those but Anyway, we move on. Uh, let me uh, let me go up to uh, we'll go up to Shuckle because he doesn't look like he's going to be too much into the action at this stage of the game. Um, now, so uh, uh, where were we? We'll talk about the Mongols. I, I think that's their biggest weakness, right? Obviously, the Mongols are incredibly strong in the early game, and they're probably going to pick up a couple of bit extra points in population. But you've got to remember that with this FFA mode, the monarch is going to be on the field. Uh, and one of the keys to note here is that you don't have access to a keep or a fort or a castle as the Mongols. The biggest thing you've got access to is that town center. So you've got to make that TC hidden away in a nice nice spot with lots of outposts around it. And unfortunately, if there's too many knights or if you get double teamed, it is almost certainly good game. There's no real way that you can get that monarch out of there. So it's for that reason that I think while the Mongols are decent in the early game, and I think that if you went for a strategy where you tried to, to just, you know, blitzkrieg the field and just take out every single player, uh, it could work. But if you're going to be looking to get into the late game, it is a civilization that is going to be destined for a difficult time. We'll say that much. Um, Though, historically, there have been some incredible Mongol victories in Outback Octagon. Uh, sacred Site captures are a really potent thing, uh, because what you can do is you can capture the Sacred Sites and then just put outposts around the Sacred Sites, which actually work out better than keeps, just because you mainly build the outposts for their attacks rather than their, uh, than their defense uh, and th those bombarding placements. Uh, especially when you've got, like, three Sacred Sites like this all together in the middle. This is actually perfect for... Hello? I love that base. Uh, this is actually perfect for it as well because you just put all of your outposts here in the middle, get your cannon emplacements, and then you just laugh at the enemy as they try and take these sacred sites off you. And just to confirm that we do have sacred, uh, three sacred sites. Yeah, it's three sacred sites. All right, so next civilization is going to be the Chinese. The Chinese is going to be an S-tier civilization. Um, now, I, I will state that there could be a little bit of bias in here. As you guys know, I absolutely love playing the Chinese because I'm very, very greedy. Uh, just like, uh, what's her name? Is it Tate McRae? Very, very greedy players. Um, and uh, naturally, um, that that type of civilization is going to, to feel good. But I think for the Chinese, one of the, the things that sets them apart is their ability to be incredibly offensive and at the same time be incredibly defensive. They've got amazing bonuses for free-for-all, which if, if I listed them all, we'd be here all day. But I'll just list a couple of them. The, the big ones is... Uh, it's going to be tax. So tax from the Imperial official is incredibly powerful because it's going to be going all game. It gives you an infinite source of gold. They've got some of the best defense uh, in the form of their, their stone walls and their landmarks, like going for the Great Wall Gatehouse. Um, they've got access to long-range hand cannoneers, which are a, an incredibly powerful unit in the late game. And 
I think the biggest thing for the Chinese is the palace guard, which isn't that amazing. In the, I say it isn't that amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, it, it, the highlight for me isn't the late game. It's actually the early game for the palace guard. What the Chinese can do is they can say, all right, I'm just going to go castle age. And we, we've seen this with the Juicy Legacy. We've seen this with the Chinese where they go castle age and they get out a whole bunch of palace guards and they just rampage across the map. They start taking out monarchs everywhere or, or landmarks everywhere. They just go and go and go. And that is because of the palace guard. The palace guard is the only unit that can do that. The reason why is because the palace guard cannot be countered by spearmen like the knight or the, the horseman can. So, and it's very, very quick, which means you can't catch it. You can send knights after it and the knights will, will beat the palace guards, but the palace guards will do very well against them as well, especially if they outnumber, uh, then they will be okay. The palace guard is just a very difficult to deal with unit. Not gonna happen, but we're gonna get the whole the whole sound. No, we don't get that last little bit unless it's actually going off. Um, so I think that the Chinese, if, if you're playing as the Chinese, you're going to have in the early game a lot of, of safety against anyone who's near you because of the Barbican. You're going to be able to take them out with the Jukunu and, and uh, battering rams. Uh, and then you're going to be able to get to Castle Age. And if you get up uncontested, it means that you're going to be able to take out your neighbors with palace guards. And then in the event that you make it to the late game, you're going to be feeling incredibly good about yourself as your hand cannoneer spearman combo just combos incredibly well with your uh, late game Imperial officials that are supervising up all of your buildings or all of your production facilities um, and just picking up infinite amounts of tax. It feels good to be Chinese playing free for all S tier. Uh, speaking of uh, of S tier, well, not quite so much. It's going to be the French. They're our next popular civilization. Going to be going in the B tier. Now, the reason that they're going in the B tier and not in the S tier, which is where they used to be for free-for-alls, is because of the nerf to stone at the guild hall. I know that seems really specific, but let me explain. One of the things that we started seeing in top-level free-for-alls was how important stone was. Any way that you could increase your stone in the late game, so that being through something like trade or through the guild hall, it became incredibly powerful. And there became a point where players really wanted the French. I remember one game uh, after we kind of realized the power of the French, there was a game where we had four people all on French in the same game. I think it was on a, um, on Tasmania. And I remember like messaging the admin for the tournament. He's like, hey, uh, I said to him like, hey, uh, what's going on? Why do we have four people that are all playing French and French is overpowered? Like, uh, have they found a way to pick their civilization? Because it was meant to be random. Uh, but we, we couldn't work it out how they'd gotten it. I think it might have just been one of those things where it's like, a, it's a, it's the the confinate or the uh, frequency illusionary bias. You become aware of the French and now all of a sudden there's 27 Frenches in one game. Uh, I, that's obviously nothing to do with frequency illusionary bias. I'm sure it's probably something else. Anyway, you get the picture. Uh, so French at the moment, they're a civilization that... In 1v1, not the strongest civilization. In late game, they're decent. I think the, the highlight, once again, is going to be that guild hall. They've also got access uh, through the Red Palace with some uh, some pretty strong town centers because they've got that ability to, to just throw that town center down at any point and then just get a little bit of backup through the Arbalist emplacement. Uh, but I think that where their real strength lies is just going to be that Royal Knight and just running around the map uh, in the Castle Age. That's going to be the big point. Trying to pick up early uh, kills on monarchs to boot to boost that population uh cap up and then once you've got that capacity that it has built up then what you're going to then do is turn that into an advantage so as an example if you think right like i've got the french their b tier and i'm up against a chinese player and it's 1v1 in the late game what am i going to do well what you're going to do is you're going to build more units than him because hopefully you've killed more enemies than him because you're playing the french a very aggressive civilization but if he's a good a uh, good Chinese player, he's probably killed plenty as well because he's playing uh, with uh, with those palace guards. So that's the way I see the French. Um, in the early game, they're quite a strong civilization with their school of cavalry, uh, but they're also a civilization that you, you want to try and get that second town center on, which is what we've seen Hey Tim uh, go for here, which is definitely the right call. Um, you want to try and get that economy up because it, it feels like you can fall behind pretty quickly uh, with the French. All right, well, let's check in with the next civilization. It's going to be the Order of the Dragon. You might find this one highly toxic, but in my opinion, I think Order of the Dragon will be S tier. I think this this civilization is going to be absolutely bonkers when it comes to free for all. Let me explain. The Order of the Dragon have villages that cost one population, the same as every other civilization. The difference, though, is that these villages gather much faster, significantly faster, 28% faster, and that's the base gather rate. So remember that your upgrades are on top of that. Remember that your wheelbarrow is on top of that. And it means that their baseline for economy is very similar if we were to take a look at, say, the 20th minute or the 25th minute. 
But once we start taking a look at the 30th minute or the 35th minute, when that population becomes relevant, then all of a sudden we have got a problem. And that is that their economy is much stronger than other civilizations when they're on the same villager population. And that's why I think that in the late game in particular, the Order of the Dragon will probably be the strongest civilization. Stronger than China, stronger than the Byzantines, stronger than anybody. Uh, and it's largely going to be because of their, uh, their economy. I think their economy is going to be absolutely ludicrous. I think that this civilization also has some good flexibility in the mid game. Uh, they can look to go into the Burgrave option because remember, while you want to play around relics and while you want to play around regnets, it's not always going to be easy to pick those relics up. And I think that going into the Burgrave allows you to take players out very quickly. And we've, we've seen that time and time again in Outback Octagon. Uh, we saw, I remember watching Blade 55555 take out players non-stop uh, with, uh, hey, we got, we got three sacred sites being taken right now by, uh, by Hey Tim. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I remember watching Blade just take out, like, I think it was three players in one game. He just dropped the Burgrave and just went ham. He had the boar and a couple of deer, and he, he just was pumping, man, and he just took people out so quickly. And, uh, well, yeah, that, that works to, that works out pretty well in the long run for you, because you're going to get a whole bunch of extra population. And so, I think if you can find kills early with the Order of the Dragon, then just kind of sit back and chill, get your Swabier up and pump out villages, and then mind your own business, and then once you get to the late game, just have a party as you all of your range units just do amazing things, you're going to be absolutely fine. I think the biggest weakness you're going to find with the Order of the Dragon is that early game. As we've got ourselves a little bit of a crossover right here. Two players not realizing that uh, they're having a little bit of a kiss. Ronald McDonald in the green going up against the combination of the Juicy Legacies uh, units. So, yeah, overall, I think that the Order of the Dragon are going to be incredibly strong. So if you like to, if you're a Giga Chad main, you're going to be happy. All right, let's move on to our next civilization. It's going to be the Rus. Uh, this civilization, I've, I had a bit of difficulty placing it. It's going to go in the B tier. Uh, and th there's the main reason for me is that as the Rus, especially in free for all, you don't have access to stone walls unless you go for the Spaskaya Tower. The problem is you don't really want to go for the Spaskaya Tower because the other landmark that they've got, which reduces the cost of siege, is really good in this game mode where you've got the Monarch. Because you've got the Monarch, you have the ability to increase that population. And one of the things to note is that as populations get bigger, right? Like, so let's imagine 200 versus 200. Okay, the armies are, are very familiar with what we've seen before. But if you scale that up to 1,000 versus 1,000, now all of a sudden you've got much bigger armies. So what that means is that Siege becomes better because Siege is AoE. So Siege does more damage because there's more units. The more units to hit, the more damage to do. And so naturally you're going to see more Siege in those, those bigger compositions. So when it comes into the Rus uh, in the late game, I'd love to see them making lots of Siege, lots of cheaper Siege, but you can't really do that because you want the Spaskaya Tower to get those stone walls in. And stone walls are very, very important. Now on the other side, or on the other hand, you do have access to the best uh, best palisade walls there are in the game by far. Uh, they build faster. They've got more health. I don't think they're cheaper anymore. I, I'd have to double check that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure at one point they were cheaper. They were like cheaper, faster to build, much hardier. It's They're just like in incredibly good. Um, but once again, you know, normal units can burn through it and it means that your monarch can be sniped. The Rus is powerful in the early game. They've got access to the Kremlin. They have a really good strategy, which is just going the Kremlin into 2TC. I don't know how potent it's going to be in free for... What is going on? We've got a landmark that is being constructed here by Shukul, uh, but um, he's just, he's decided to throw it down and then, oh, he's cancelled it up. He's like, you know what? Actually, I'm not going to build it there. Uh, I was thinking about it for a bit. Uh, he's cancelled it. Fair enough, Shukul. Uh, I'll, I'll let you off this one time. Nice trade starting to come in for Crackety here. And hey, Tim, have a look at this. 109 as well. He's going right to the corner. Look at the. I didn't even realize he's actually going through the territory of Muzz. Muzz is just kind of minding his own business, but Crackety's going to have to uh, deal with him at some point here. Hopefully it's going to... Hopefully it's going to be Muzz that, that breaks him out and says, hey, you can't trade here. This is this is my property right here. Uh, but uh, anyway, let's get into it and, uh, and talk about our next uh, civilization. It's going to be the Holy Roman Empire. Might be controversial. Drongo, why are you putting so many of them in the S tier? That is correct. The Holy Roman Empire, in my opinion, will also be S tier in the next patch in FFA especially. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little hint now. It's also going to be absolutely broken in 1v1, I reckon. The marching drills change is really going to be good for them. Uh, it'll just mean you don't have to get that blacksmith down uh, anywhere near as early as you did before. Spears are going to be crazy. But anyway, let's let's get to it. So, Holy Roman Empire, uh, love to take relics early. Exactly the same as the Order of the Dragon do. Uh, the one difference is they can take them a fair bit earlier. Hold your horses right here. We got ourselves a big, beautiful battle beginning to unfold. 
Oh, yeah. Look at that. That is the stuff of champions. Now, I just wish I could turn it down from here. I, I can mute it. I've got a button to mute. I'm just going to mute it, okay? Because, you know, uh, this is what uh, this is what a thousand horses sound like dying as we'll just watch it. It's a bit hard to tell, but we've got yellow and purple here up against orange and blue. Uh, I, I, w I wish that uh, they, they just have like two colors that they could choose from that kind of lock it in. Like gr green and teal look really good together. But then who do you put blue with? I guess you could put blue with purple. Red and pink makes sense. And then orange and yellow. Yeah, there you go. That, there you go. Perfectly. Problem solved. Anyway. Uh, so next civilization that we're talking about, uh, which one was it? Uh, I don't even, oh, the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, of course. Uh, of course, the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, so the big thing is they love to go Castle Age. And if they have even just the slightest little bit of space, they can go Castle Age and they will go Castle Age and they will take all the relics. And that's a massive issue. There are so many games of free-for-all that I have watched where people like Beastie, Beastie's the first one to come to mind because he's just an absolute god when it comes to the Holy Roman Empire find their way into the middle of the map and it's and it looks terrible but then they've got 12 relics or just not 12 but like eight relics and the regnitz cathedral and tithe barns and they've got this huge amount of resources that are just coming into their coffers and it's very difficult to deal with when you've got that much spare resources that it's just floating into uh in, into your economy um, and it means that you're gonna have more units out on the map and it gives you just a huge striking power uh, I, I think the Holy Roman Empire, they're not weak in the early game, but they're definitely not strong in the early game. They are one of the weakest civilizations in the early game, mainly because they do want to try and get that focus into Castle Age, into Imperial Age, uh, because of things like the Palace of Swabia as well. Uh, but uh, now that now that we've cooled off, let's get that music back in. Things things are going a little bit better. Sacred Sites, what's our sacred tracker? Let's ha let's have a look. <laughs> I love this UI, dude. How good how good is this free for all UI? Hey guys, um, if you were wondering what the timer is on this sacred site, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that there are three sacred sites and they have been captured. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's a sad state of affairs, isn't it? Um, it is, it is sad. Let's, let's just hope it gets fixed up. Well, we got the, uh, Imperial Guard out now coming through from our, uh, our, our Juicy Legacy player in the north. I, I'm, I'm just gonna mute it for the moment just because we, we've got, we've got so much going on here. It just feels like it, it makes sense. Look at that, Shuku coming out, out of his, uh, out of the closet right there and just coming out onto the onto the field um yeah so with uh with regard to the holy roman empire watch out i will say that much if you if, you, if someone in your game picks a holy roman empire focus them down quickly uh it's going to be another case as well of the lanch connect doing incredibly well in free for all because it's that same idea where units that do aoe damage like we're seeing right now just excel because you've got more population space to play with which means more units and more units mean more targets more targets mean more damage on aoe things or on, on units that have aoe so the lunch connector is going to do very well uh because it's going to be harder to focus them down because with larger armies you've only got so much apm where you can focus down those lunch connector so if you've got you know 100 men at arms and 50 lunch connect Good luck sniping those out 1v1. It's going to be very one-on-one, -on -one, one by one. That's not going to be easy. We'll say that much. All right, well, let's move on now to our next civilization. Which one is it going to be? It's going to be Jean of Arc. This civilization, similar to the French, I think is going to be let down largely uh, by its late game. Uh, if anything, I'm actually, I'm, I'm kind of tempted just to put this into the A tier right now, um, just because I've thought of one thing, and that that is Joan herself. I think that in the late game, Joan has the ability to turn the tide incredibly. Uh, the way that she has access to the cannon as well gives you that infinite source of uh, gold, but I think it also gives you an infinite source of nuisance. What do I mean by that? So say as an example here, you've got Yellow uh, who, who has taken the sacred sites, or, or I don't know, maybe he's made a wonder or something, and you're on the other side of the map. Well, what do you do? You just take Joan, you bring her over here, you bring your cannon down here, and she summons it. And now all of a sudden, you've got a way through these stone walls. I know they're not stone. Pretend they're stone. Now you've got a way through these stone walls. She also summons some men at arms, so you can build some battering rams there with her. It all of a sudden becomes a threat that you have to respond to as a defender. And that's annoying. That's really annoying. On top of that, she's got access to abilities uh, that increase um, the, I think it's the attack speed of her entire army. And it's for quite some time as well. And when you think about it, you know, the more units, the more units that can be buffed, right? So she's getting better value off that compared to 1v1 because there's more units that are affected by that. Uh, and that's a good thing for Joan of Arc. I think where she's let down most is going to be, once again, that guild hall. Uh, she is quite strong in the early game. And with free for all, there will be more boars on the map for you to be uh, able to kill. So the more boars you can find, then all of a sudden... Uh, then the more that uh, the more that you'll be able to build that XP and look for that earlier level. Uh, the one thing I think that also that lets her down is because she's going to start with one less villager. I think that will hurt her um, as well. But anyway, uh, Joan of Arc, 
combination's pretty good, right? Like the Arbalatria together with the Royal Knight is is very strong. We've seen uh, Arbalatria just with Spearman do incredibly well. The Arbalatria just in general is is such an insanely good unit um, that. I think combined with Jones bonuses where you get that all that attack speed, like pushing into somebody with those bonuses, it just feels incredible. So I wouldn't be surprised if we do see Joan being quite a popular pick for season seven free for all. Let's move on to our next civilization. It's going to be the Juicy Legacy. It's going to be another civilization. And I know you're going to say, but Drongo, how many can you put in the S tier? They can't all be S tier. If they're all S tier, none of them are S tier. I know, I know. But come on, this is an emergency tier list. We don't know how it's going to go. So I've got to put them all in the S tier just in case, just in case. And speaking of just in case, have a look at this. Hey, Tim, looking to jump in through to the base of Muzz. And this is the consequence of putting your buildings or putting your bases in separate parts of the map. We've seen pretty much everybody else go together. And unfortunately for Fagul Sang and Muzz, uh, they have gone their separate ways. And that hurts them quite a bit in this. Uh, keep in mind, in your free-for-all games, there's not going to be any teaming, I hope. Uh, and as a result, uh, you, won't, you won't be faced with this issue. All right, so let's uh, let's let's talk about uh, the Juicy Legacy. So much similarly to the Chinese, they have access to Palace Guards, which are an incredible unit. We've talked about them plenty already, uh, but the reason why they're so good is just because of their movement speed. Uh, you will have crazy good movement speed uh, with the Juicy Legacy because they have access to the Temple of the Sun. Let's see if we can find the Temple of the Sun. That's the Juicy's library. That's the Xiangnan Tower. It doesn't look like we have the Temple of the Sun up just yet. So has our have we really not go, gone into any dynasties? But the I think we've the only dynasty we've gone into is into the Song dynasty. So I haven't gone into the, the Yuan dynasty or the Ming dynasty just yet for our uh, Juicy Legacy players. Uh, but that is absolutely okay. Beautiful farming economy here as well. Um, but uh, they, with access to the palace guards, they've got... Or the, with, ac with their palace guards, they've got incredibly uh, strong uh, potential. Uh, so we've seen it time and time again where the Juicy Legacy or the Chinese... Uh, they will stay one base, they'll go into Song Dynasty, but what they will do is they will take fishing early on. And if they have an uncontested fishing economy, they can convert that, that very easily into a, a oh, nice little hill that we've got here. They can convert that very easily uh, into a big mass of palace guards. And that palace guard mass can really push and do a lot of damage. It can take out neighbors uh, and you can march across the map with it. Uh, in the late game, the Juicy Legacy has got access to this bad boy right here, the Imperial Guard, considered by many to be one of the best cavalry units in the game. It's got decent speed, great health, wonderful statistics. Uh, and there's further ways that you can buff that up through things like the Ming Dynasty. Uh, you can uh, buff it up with biology. Uh, you can buff it up in, in uh, also with uh, access to the Temple of the Sun. When it does inevitably come up, it will also increase the damage that this cavalry does. So not, lots of nice little ways that you can uh, build this Imperial Guard unit up. Uh, the other thing is the Juicy Legacy have an incredibly good economy. Uh, they have access to Triple Granary, just like the Chinese do. They have access to the Imperial Officials. So you're going to be collecting those resources all, all throughout the game. Let's get that music back in. Uh, so you'll be collecting that, that free tax all game. Uh, and you've also got access to technologies like Advanced Administration, which isn't very good in 1v1, but is incredibly good uh, in free-for-alls. And the reason why is if we take a look right now at these three um, the, these three granaries, I guarantee you that they're going to have ridiculous amounts of tax on them. Have a look at this. 555, 666, 13. So this one doesn't count because it's close enough. But these two at the back, they don't get their tax collected. And the reason why is just because of the mechanics of the Imperial Official. It's a silly system, but I promise you, this upgrade actually fixes it because it allows them to carry more and so they can empty it. As long as they've got somewhere that they can drop off nearby, I think you can probably drop it off here. No, you can't drop it off here, uh, but you can probably drop it off at the town center. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, so it, it basically means that your gold economy in the late game is going to be guaranteed really, really good. Um, just having, I, I remember doing the math on the three um, granaries. I'm pretty sure it works out to be somewhere around 700 gold a minute just coming through from taxes when you've got, I think it's about 100 villages on it. It is a ludicrous amount of tax that comes through. Uh, but let's uh, let's get rid of that sound because things are about to start blasting. Um, the other thing to note is that they've got access to an age three uh, relic wonder, which is the Shaolin Monastery. We've seen uh, the Juicy Legacy go for fast castles quite often uh, in the early stages of the expansion pack. So we, we saw the Juicy Legacy go crazy with the bald build, uh, the bald man build. Um, and uh, that is no exception when it comes to FFA. So they'll be looking to pick up all those relics and then transition that those relics into maybe a, a two or a three TC economy, look to play in the corner. If they're lucky, maybe get some palace guards out, try and take somebody out. Very, very strong civilization. Watch out for the Juicy.
All right, next civilization. It's going to be the Delhi Sultanate. It's going to be our very first entrant into the D tier. This civilization absolutely sucks. Don't pick it. Don't play it unless you love Delhi. In which case, go for it. If you want to have fun as the Delhi Sultanate, then be my guest. It's absolutely a welcome thing to do. Uh, but if you're, you know, if, if you're my friend and you're asking for advice, I'm going to tell you, hey, can you avoid picking the Delhi Sultanate? In the Outback Octagon, we see we did see Delhi Sultanate players win games. Uh, Don Artie, in particular, uh, became notorious for his silly Delhi antics. Uh, but uh, I, I think he was the exception rather than the rule. And that carries over into FFA in Season 7. The Delhi Sultanate are a civilization that are cursed by how long they take to get their upgrades. It can be a blessing sometimes, but it is most always a curse having those free upgrades once the civilization does get into the late game, they do have access to some crazy good weapons, uh, most notably uh, the elephants. Uh, so taking advantage of things like the Sultan's... Is it called? What is it? The Sultan's Hand Cannoneer is pretty crazy, and you can pair it with things like spears to block enemy spears, uh, and you can pair it with um, scholars to heal up. And once you reach that mass, it can be a very difficult to deal with uh, threat that your opponent's up against. Uh, but actually getting to that stage is hard. And like the attack that we saw before... Oh, we got Muzz getting eliminated. Apologies. Didn't even see it over here. Uh, looks like, hey, Tim has managed to, to take him out and secure that trade route now. So he is going to be very happy, or at least his teammate, Crackity here, will be very happy as they've now secured up that trade route. Feels like a little bit of an imbalance. They're having Crackity here, a 2K rated player playing with Hey Tim. I don't know who Hey Tim is, but so far, Hey Tim, you've been playing pretty well. Hey Tim. Um... Anyway, uh, let's uh, let's keep on moving on um, with regard to the Delhi Sultanate. They can take their sacred sites early, uh, which is always nice uh, having the sacred sites early, but uh, it can be rare that you actually get it off because if there's anybody nearby who's paying attention, they'll just bring a scout over and, and try and deny that from you. So you will have to, to make units, and that's something that you want to typically avoid in FFAs unless you're actually going to be killing somebody. So yeah, anyway, it's I, I think it can work, but it's one of those civilizations that become a little bit more advanced. All right, next civilization up. It's going to be the Ayubids. It's a civilization I'm going to be putting in C tier. Now, I think for this civ, it's probably still a little bit, you know, we, we don't know 100% how it's going to go. Uh, the, the one or the main reason why I'm thinking this is the Ayubids seem to do well in 1v1 and they've definitely got a go-to strategy. And I think that that strategy will work in free-for-alls. The one thing I'm scared about is the late game for the Ayubids. I'm fearful that they don't have enough of that super late game composition. Obviously, they've got access to Camel, uh, to Camel Lance. Big fight now coming through. Have a look at this. We've got plenty of Royal Knights. The Hank and Aeneas on the back, back line. I think there's Hank and Aeneas. Yeah, Hank and Aeneas are in here uh, on the back. Lots of... I'm loving these Elite Royal Knights. So these, these are nice, fully upgraded against those Imperial Guard. Let's compare the stats, actually. 28 plus 8, 408. Yeah, they, they've got... They do much greater uh, damage, and they have uh, slightly higher health here. Uh, what's the armor like? Oh my god, look at the armor, dude. They have 13 armor versus... Well, 13, 6 against what would be 8 and 8. So crazy amounts of melee armor over there as well for the Imperial Guard. Keep in mind, I don't think they're actually fully upgraded. He does have the Ming Dynasty. Uh, actually, they might be fully upgraded. No, they're not because he doesn't have ax He doesn't have the Temple of the Sun. The Temple of the Sun should be on this bad boy right here, Divine Charge. But it's not. He's got Infantry Speed on that instead. So it should be on Divine Charge. So even this isn't even my final form. That's what he's saying right now. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll watch as we, we talk ab about the Aubids. So the Aubids... I think they're going to do well in the pocket if they come up against anybody. But my main fear is once they make it to the late game, how well is their economy going to stack up against civilizations like the Chinese or the Juicy Legacy that have got, you know, 30% gather bonus plus infinite gold? And I, I suspect the answer is not that well. They do have things like the Atabags, which will probably become compulsory. But then once again, you suffer with um, the consequence of these of scale. Atabags, there's only going to be seven of them out, which means that you can only make seven buildings produce increased health. Uh, oh gosh, painful to watch right there as Shukul loses out one of those bombards. Manages to keep a couple of them alive though. All the Imperial Guard have managed to escape here, but uh, looks like Hey Tim and Crackity here will push through the center. Keep in mind on the backside, we do still have these two down to the south side, the greased up Greek guy, as well as uh, 10 4 Tim. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that with the Aubids, they're going to struggle quite a bit in the late game. We'll see how it goes. As, as you guys will know, this is an emergency tier list, which means that it's not 100% confirmed yet. It's more my suspicions. 
Anyway, that's going to be the Aubids. And then we'll jump into the Malians, a civilization that has been a little bit controversial lately. I did put out a video recently talking about how I absolutely hated that strategy uh, that uh, Louis MT was doing. I tell you what, that scares me. Any Anybody who knows about my playstyle, I basically like to ignore the, the edges and just fight down the middle. That's pretty much it. Like just one front, fight me like man to man. You know, you know that th there's that fight from, I can't remember exactly when it was. It must be like the early 2000s or the 90s between, I think it's a Japanese fighter and... Uh, I suspect probably an American fighter. He definitely looks like the caricature of an American fighter. Um, and uh, that, <laughs> they just start punching each other and they don't stop. They just don't stop. Somebody make them stop, please. Anyway, that's the way I, I like to fight. Um, so yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about the Marlians. The Marlians are a civilization that don't need a lot of space initially, but they will start to take those pit mines and hope that they've got gold nearby. Uh, they've got quite a bit of power in the early game. And I think lasting over to the late game as well, um, the main thing that I, or the main issue I've got is when it comes to their Imperial Age composition. They're going to try and rely on the sofa, um, but their archers do fall off quite a bit in the Imperial Age, but that's okay because I'll have access to the Musafari. Uh, but I think overall, there's nothing that really attracts me to this civilization as, you know, like, oh, that that's amazing. What they do have, their bonuses are infinite bonuses, so they have infinite food. They also have a slight amount of infinite gold, so it works out probably to be like about 400 gold per minute infinite, which isn't too bad when you think about it, but compare that to, say, like, the Juicy Legacy or the Chinese that are getting a thousand plus, or the English that are getting a thousand plus, or the Holy Roman Empire with their Regnitz Cathedral that are getting well and truly over a thousand plus, because they will secure relics, and that 400 a minute really does become quite... Uh, What's, what's the word? Unimpactful, negligible in the long run. That's that's the way I think about it. Anyway, uh, the, the Malians, I think they'll, they'll be powerful in the early game. So Javelin Donzo will do very well um, because it's such an easy combo to control uh, and you'll be able to punish anyone who, who's close to you. Um, but I, I really do think in the late game, they're going to fall off unless they're able to get that really big advantage uh, by taking out people early on. And then finally, our last civilization, our least popular civilization. This civilization has a play rate of like 2.6% or something like that. This is the 1v1 stats. I'll, I'll be honest. I was looking at the um, the statistics and 1v1 is like insane how popular it is. I didn't... Ranked 1v1. I didn't realize how popular it was. I, I thought that quick match 4v4 would be way more popular than it. Nope. 1v1 is like by far the most popular game mode. Um, so I'm curious to see the numbers for FFA as well. But obviously they'll be a bit skewed because there's more civilizations happening per game. But I, I think that the Abyssid Dynasty is going to be in a solid A tier. And mainly because they are very strong in the late game. If you've ever played an FFA with the Abyssid before, you will know how difficult they are to deal with in the late game. They have an incredibly good economy. It's absolutely crushing. They've got lots of different ways to buff up their economy. And they also have very strong units. So the Camel Rider is one of the best units in the game when it gets to the late game. Huge amounts of armor, massive HP pool, doesn't really lose to anything against just spearmen and even then because it's hp pool is, or health pool is so big hp pool health pool is so big uh in the first place it doesn't really care about that um they've also got a lot of options with how they play um i think the main weakness is going to be in the early game so getting rushed looking to be defensive and the other big weakness to the abyssid dynasty similar to the aubids in this regard which i i failed to mention and I think I almost might be tempting uh, to bring them down to the C tier in this in this situation or in in this discussion because uh, I, I neglected to consider it until this point. Is that they've only got two landmarks, and that's a really big thing because when it comes to eliminations uh, in in free for all, you can be eliminated through your landmarks. So if you lose your landmarks, you will be knocked out. Sure, your monarch will remain alive, uh, ready to be taken out. But and, and you can run your monarch around, but at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to do this with landmarks. Your, your landmarks will be, you know, typically wherever you start because you need to get that bad boy up and ready because you need to start aging to the feudal age. So that first town center, which is not this one, this is your first town center, and then your landmark will probably, or your uh, house of wisdom, probably right here. That's it. If you lose these two landmarks, your good is gone because when it comes to free for all in season seven, you're going to have the uh, landmark victory, you're going to have, or not the landmark victory, I should say the landmark, I mean, technically there is a landmark victory, but landmark defeat. You're going to have monarch defeat, which is like the, the regicide. You're going to have the sacred defeat. You have the um, the wonder defeat is the other one. So I think it's the four that you've got there, basically. Uh, so this is something that you need to be very aware of and playing as the Abbasid and the Ayubids, or the Abbasid uh, in Outback Octagon, what we would see players do is they would start off and they, they might put their town center here and they would put, their house of wisdom in the corner and one of the things that did happen is if they couldn't bridge the distance soon enough 
it would just get taken out. The House of Wisdom would get focused down. You know, a couple of horsemen up here, I say a couple, you know, a handful, two handfuls, probably like four handfuls, uh, comes up, torches it down, spearmen come up, they just run around, give them a loop-de-loop, -loop, throw it back up there. It's really annoying to deal with. Uh, so that is something that you need to be aware of playing the Abbasid. But I think overall, uh, if the Abbasid can make it to the late game, they're going to be a very strong civilization, but we will have to move them down to the B tier just simply because overall... They are. They're not going to. Um, they're not going to have that uh, defensibility of a civilization like the Chinese or the Juicy Legacy. Uh, they're not going to have. You know. And can I just say that there's so many things that I I still haven't mentioned that make the S tier civilizations S tier. Like just to mention a couple of them. Juicy Legacy. The fact that you get all these extra landmarks means that you can survive a little bit longer on the landmarks. Uh, and that obviously if you if you keep them your monarch safe, you're going to be okay. For the Holy Roman Empire, uh, another big factor is emergency repairs. So if you've got a keep that's on a sacred site, you can emergency repair that sacred site. The, these things just really uh, push those civilizations up and over the limit. I haven't even like mentioned them, but they, they become a really big factor uh, in these games because stone being difficult, uh, landmarks being important, uh, it is naturally going to happen. But anyway, that's going to be the tier list. That's where we finish up at. Let me know. Well, hold on. I, I will just also say, don't quit the video right now because we're going to watch the, to the end of this video because we've got our sacred victory coming up here on the cards. We've got three sacred sites that have been captured and a lot of infrastructure coming down. Not to mention the fact that we've also got Pax Mongolica, which has been researched here for our Mongol player. And we haven't seen the Mongols in FFA before with this technology. It gives them a little bit more uh, fire resistance, gives them a little bit more health. Does he really not have YAM network? Oh, that's YAM network improved. Okay, that's fine then. Uh, so anyway, this is that's the end of the tier list component. So if, if that's all you came here for, there you go. Uh, but if you want to see the end of this game, we'll keep on going. But I'll, I'll just wrap up the tier list. So I think overall, uh, this is what it's going to look like uh, for the beginning of Season 7 FFA. You'll see these are the most powerful civilizations, the weaker civilizations down here. Um, and uh, yeah, overall, if you've got any feedback, please let me know. If you think I missed something egregious, please point it out. If you disagree with me, that's absolutely fine. But just remember that we are allowed to have our differences of opinion. Uh, but let's get into it because we have got the end of this FFA or this 2v2v2v2 to enjoy. We've got mangoes on one side. On the other side, we've got the nest of bees and boy, oh boy, is that loud. It feels so loud going from no sound to all of this sound all of a sudden. I'm going to have to raise my voice to compensate. Apologies for your headphone users out there. Sacred Sight's being held. Now, keep in mind, we don't know how long this has been, uh, how long this has been held for at the moment, but the Grenadiers are pushing up. Mango, big shots coming out. Cleans up plenty of those. Unfortunately, we can't see the health pool of them. Even if we select them, we can't see the health pool because I've, I've got it turned off at the moment. Towards that top side, a few farms coming up. What else have we got? Just lots of production, more Royal Knights making their way out. Uh, the, the big factor here is we're going to need to see our two players on the south side push into here. But look at the outpost number from Crackety. Crackety's got absolutely ludicrous amounts of outpost here. And have a look at this bombard emplacements that are coming through, making sure that any units that push in are going to have to deal with AoE. And remember how powerful AoE is when it comes to FFA games. Now, slowly and steadily, they are pushing back. How is the build-up coming through on this north side? Let's take a look and see whether we can track their incomes. Get a bit of an idea. Where... God, this is terrible. Uh, get a bit... I love that Muzz has been knocked out uh, and yet still somehow he's gathering resources. Uh, is, is that him? Where? Muzz was... De Wait, why does it say Muzz was Delhi? Was Muzz... Oh, yeah, Muzz was Delhi. What, what's he still gathering? Is it the relics? Yeah, it's the relics. He's still got relics going with... with uh... Wait, he never got Tithe Barns. It can't be Tithe Barns. How's he getting all those extra resources? Anyway, hand cannon here. Three minutes until Sacred Defeat. There it is. Three minutes until Sacred Defeat. They're going to need to start standing on the dance floor if they want this to stop. From the south side, the attacks are continuing. Have a look at this. We got ourselves a little bit of Manjanique magic coming in. Slowly peppering down the Angus's of Crackety here. He's going to rally in some more units here. Have a look how little damage these boys are taking, though. Look at this. Just getting hit with it. They don't even care. I wish I could show you how much damage they're not taking right now, but just just imagine that they've got full health bars because that, that's pretty much where it is. Meanwhile, towards that top side, Lament and I being rallied in. These guys have got their elite upgrades. Elite army tactics are through. Plus threes all around. Oh, my Lord! Look at the amount of Royal Knights that come through from Hey Tim. Two Tims in the game, but I tell you what, Hey Tim has just decided I'm going to make an, enough Royal Knights for both of us. You and me, 10-4 Tim. Meanwhile, on that south side, 10-4 Tim says, don't worry, I'll still make Sofa, but he's going to have to deal with these Bombard emplacements. Remember, not all of the outposts have got them just yet, but plenty of them do have it. He's going to look to try and focus landmarks here. Let's see exactly how many he can find as he comes through. Plenty of sheep, not a lot of villagers. And now looking to focus uh, the pastures, of course, the most important part of any Mongol base, the pastures. You know, often we talk about the farm heartland of, of you know, the Juicy Legacy base. Well, for the Mongols, it's going to be this one right here. Meanwhile, two minutes until Sacred Defeat. Get your timers out if you haven't already. 
because these guys are intent on making it stop. Make it stop. Make it stop. Please make it stop. But look at the Manganel response. And this is part of why when it comes to FFA, the king is AoE. It is all about, you know, Weird Al said it well when he said it's all about the Pentiums. I'm going to say it right now. It's all about the AoE. It's all about the Manganique. It's all about the Grenadier. Maybe not the Grenadier. The Grenadier is kind of meh. Uh, but uh, anything that's got AoE, Lynch Connector, Manganique, Manganel, uh, Cannon Emplacement, Bombard. Uh, it's not the Cannon Emplacement. It's the Bombard Emplacement, right? I don't know exactly. I get confused between the two. There we go. The Cannon Emplacement. The Bombard's the one that comes out and goes boom. And the Cannon Emplacement's the one that sits still and goes boom. All right, so holding the sacred sites, units on every sacred site. That's going to be really important. You need to keep a unit on the sacred site just to make sure that if your enemy comes through, you're going to be able to contest that sacred site, that it's not going to be neutralized. Uh, we're not going to be able to pay attention to it other than waiting for that timer. We're about to see it, I think. The one minute timer. Any second now. There it is. Okay, keep get your clocks out for 50 minutes and 49 seconds. That's when they need to make the final push by. And speaking of final push, here it comes. Shuckle's going to step onto the sacred site. And with that, we now see it neutralizing. This could be it, right? Oh my God, this is definitely not it. That is a lot of units now coming through here. We enter into the cinematic mode. It is time, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the amount of cavalry that is here. It definitely feels like Tim got the message. We need you to rally, son, and rally he did towards that south side. Camels are coming through. A couple yellow units need to make their way. They're on the sacred site as well. We're seeing neutralization come through from both two sacred sites, two different angles. The keep, keeping it alive. The Royal Knights trying to survive and will not have a problem as they clean up the majority of the teal units here. They rotate towards that south side of the sacred site, slowly neutralizing, slowly needs to get units there, needs to hold them off the sacred site so that he, yeah, beautiful block, beautiful block. He needs to stop, oh no, one unit's gotten onto it. It's gonna be a single Keshik to save the day. The Spearman gonna be able to follow it up. No, it's a whole bunch of hand cannons. He manages to get through. Have a look at this, the Manganiques, the Mangan Manganels are causing all of these royal knights to flood unfortunately they're they're being backed up though a little bit of a bottleneck cleaning it out on the south side back towards the top and now we start to see why ffa is the best game mode there is in age of empires 4 just like that it looks like it is all over red rover with sacred sites being cleared out and so many damn royal knights they just don't stop how many villages has he even got we need to check how many villages are you running right now tim i need to see tim is currently sitting on 17 villages 150 Royal Knights with 10 more in queue. Tim is looking to carry this game on behalf of Crack... Well, not on behalf, but for Crackity. And now, as all of the sacred sites are cleared out, the game is over. Ladies and gentlemen, your victors hate Tim and Crackity here, but at the end of the day, the real victors are us because we got to enjoy it. I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. It's going to be any second now, right? Or are they really still holding on? For Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Look at this. It's coming back up. This one's safe. Oh, oh, the sofa from behind. The sofa from behind. They make it to the sacred site. It's neutralizing. Oh, just when Drongo thought it was over, it ain't even started yet. Neutralizing the sacred site towards the top side. He's standing on it, holding it, wanting to prevent any opponents from getting on here. But unfortunately, all of those Royal Knights come charging in. The sofa warrior is not going to be able to find it. Meanwhile, towards the bottom side, more and more Manganels or Manganiques rallying through here. Hey, Tim, where are those, where, where are those Royal Knights at? We might need a couple down here. He says, nah, don't worry. I'm pushing back on the top side. We're fine. The sacred site holding in the middle. Will it be a victory towards the two civilizations that I consider to be the worst here? The, the, we've got the Mongols and the French. I mean, we did also have the, uh, the Delhi Sultanate on one team. But I think they've played it well. And that's going to be it, ladies and gentlemen. The game is all over Red Rover. Anyway, we will leave it there. I hope you guys are enjoying this FFA content. Uh, there's going to be plenty more coming up. This channel is going to be turning from a competitive 1v1 channel to an FFA channel. It is time. <laughs> I'm, I'm entering into my retirement phase. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much for watching.